Hello, I'm Fantastic and Fantastic, and today I'm going to be reviewing the Wisdom King series that has just been released in North America. So, as a little bit of a background, the Wisdom Kings are a new pantheon, if I'm not mistaken, and they feature five cards that do not have ultimate evolutions, so their base stats are on the lower end, they're about 700 or so on average, along with them only having six awakenings. This is actually more awakenings than the average monster, I guess it's perhaps to try and help compensate against power creep, and in addition to help maybe counteract those low base stats, all of them actually have the co-op boost multiplier awakening, so they do gain 50% more while at co-op. However, all these bonuses and any other bonus is lost if your leader, if those cards as a leader or just the cards as a sub are bound, so keep that in mind because they are vulnerable to binds. But what makes this Wisdom Kings series so interesting is that they have unique actives as well as leader skills, so they provide something new for your monster box that may not be used all the time, but having a new tool as part of your arsenal can be invaluable, especially when we move forward into new and harder content. So I'm going to be reviewing them each one at a time, discussing their strengths, weaknesses, as well as their usability. So the first one is Trail Yokai, I'm not going to say that, but it's the Red Wisdom King and, well, Wisdom Queen in this case, but she has a modest amount of awakenings, like she has dual time extends that goes synergistically well with her leader skill. However, I'm going to look at her active skill first. So her active skill deals 20% damage equal of the enemy's maximum HP. Now, it's their maximum health, not current health, and that's a big difference because that means they have the potential to actually execute a boss. Like, if they're, say, at, say, 60% health, you actually deal exactly 20%, and you bring them to 40 So that is invaluable because now you have a fixed gravity. You no longer have to worry about, will this do enough damage? You know exactly this is going to do one-fifth of their health every single time. And in theory, if you have multiple of her, you can actually kill a boss. Like, say you had five, like, hypothetically speaking. You could just do five gravities in a row and instantly kill them. Not necessarily practical, but it's something to keep in mind. But it's mostly for the fact that you can use the gravity to instantly push a boss to a zone that you wish to have them in. Like, if you're dealing with a boss with 50% resolve and you get them to maybe like 65% or so, this gravity will guarantee that you push them below that resolve uh, threshold and you can actually kill them. However, outside of a unique active which can be inherited, which you need to keep in mind, is that this Wisdom Queen has a really interesting leader skill. She is somewhat similar to Woken Kushi in that they have no Skyfalls and they have to hit high number of combos to activate. However, they have a large defensive multiplier alongside of great offensive capabilities. So they provide one and a half times health and um, two times attack, as well as six times recovery when lots of combos. So if you make at least nine combos, you actually max out at 2.25 times health, 196 times attack, and 49 times recovery. So you instantly heal to full health. Like There's no question, you're healing to full health no matter what. And you always have this passive 2.25 times health. So this is useful because a lot of times when you're playing these combo-based leaders about Skyfalls, you actually can only sometimes make seven combos on a board. Sometimes you're only given seven combos, and that can be frustrating. Sometimes you actually have eight. Rarely you actually have nine. So this leader here, it has a passive four times damage with like any number of combos, and then it jumps to 144 times at eight. So you have no damage control, you're just a 4 times, 144, and then 196. Like, it's kind of weird, like there is no controlling of your damage. However, you have that defensive capabilities, and if the dungeon has no absorption mechanics, they can make actually quite a strong leader, because you are a much tankier than Kushinadahim, and you always heal to full health. Granted, you probably won't be able to activate every single turn, but that extra health helps compensate, and you're always healed to full health every single time. So you probably would want to use the health badge, because you don't need any other type of benefit, in all honesty. Maybe time extend if you're really struggling, but it is a powerful leader if there's no absorption mechanic. I wouldn't take them into arena necessarily because you're taking a big gamble because you'll never kill Vishnu, and you will probably spend 99 turns, you will, not probably, you will spend 99 turns on Parvati, so on and so forth. But they are a fun leader. It can work well in certain dungeons. You're not going to necessarily use them for easy content because it's impractical to make eight combos consciously all the time but it's something to keep in mind. Like, they're basically just a tankier Kushi without a scaling multiplier component that is e able to sweep easier content. So, 
It's an interesting card. Again, it's something new and novel that we don't have yet, so it's well worth, at least if you acquire them, it's well worth investing in them. Next is Kundali, and they follow a similar pattern of awakenings. They have the co-op multiplier boost, and they actually have dual skill binders, this, which can be helpful. And they actually have quite a powerful active. They are akin to Awoken or akin to Hermes in the sense they're a double orb changer, but they also provide one additional combo for two turns more cooldown. So whether or not that's beneficial is up to you, but because they change a different element, fire and hearts to water, they have different combo synergies that Hermes does not. For instance, you can combo with Scald, and that was something Hermes never could beforehand. So just something small to keep in mind. However, it's their leader skill that you're probably more interested in, and they also have no Skyfalls, so you obviously have perfect damage control with no Skyfalls, and they passively grant 20% damage reduction at all times, so dual leaders actually results in a 36% damage reduction all the time, which is quite, is, is not, which is helpful. It's not necessarily game-breaking, like it's reasonable, it helps against gravities, provided you're not bound, so that is nice, but the thing is, it's not enough to survive certain mechanics. Like, you might survive a few things that you normally wouldn't, but you probably would still die to the harder things. So it's not obviously strong enough to compete with Heart Cross meta. Krishna obviously offers more durability, ultimate raw dragon, so on and so forth, but it's something small, not terrible, but it's something to keep in mind. However, it's their leader skill that's um, the multiplier aspect is interesting because they actually cap out at 100 times attack if you make four water combos. Now you're thinking, hmm, water combos, 100 times, Sars Body, which is true, like Sars Body is the most comparable card to Kundali. And Sarasvati is, in most regards, a superior leader, because Sarasvati is really the ultimate glass cannon. She only requires 9 water orbs to deal 100 times damage. She can stack rows more easily, and her damage ramps up higher than almost any other leader in the game in terms of ease of activation as well. So Sarasvati is great at what she does, and Kundali does kind of like that, but not as efficient, because it requires 12 water orbs for activation, and those 12 water orbs mean you actually cannot make a row as easily, you're more orb hungry, and yes you have a defensive multiplier, but you're not bringing Sarah's body into dungeons with crazy mechanics, you're bringing her into dungeons where that you need to hit hard and fast. Like, you just hit hard and fast, and that's all you really care about. Kundali might have more survivability, but it's not doing the job as efficiently because you're more orb hungry. Plus you have no skyfalls, yes you can control your damage, but it's just not as efficient. Furthermore, Kundali can't stack rows as well. You could, in theory, make um, one row and then combos above, but it's not going to be as much damage because their awakenings are not as potent as Sarah's body. So you're doing less damage, you're more orb hungry, and you don't have Skyfalls to help you out. So it's just more awkward overall. Yes, their active is more impactful than Sarah's body, it's a much better active to have for glass cannon style teams, but it's just the fact that they're going to be harder to activate is what's going to really keep them behind Sarah's body. So I feel that Sarah's body is going to have much more playtime. She's much more accessible, more people have her, and she just does more damage. So it's kind of like almost a poor man's Sarah's body. So just something to keep in mind. Like It's still useful, it's good to have, especially if you don't have Sarah's body. But if you have Sarah's body, you may not use them as much outside of maybe a skill inheritance option at this point in time. So next is Akala. And Akala has triple time extends as well as a co-op boost, which they all have. And their active skill grants one additional combo for one turn and one turn haste on a seven turn cooldown. So right away you feel like, hmm, there is potential for system, you can loop skills, so on and so forth. However, it's their leader skill that's going to be most appealing. They also have no skyfalls, so you have to, you can't get lucky, of course. But they provide one and a half times health, attack, and recovery for wood cards, passively. So that's nice, you're more durable, you have 2.25 times health and recovery at all times. However, it's their offensive capabilities that get people excited because... They offer three times attack for each wood or fire cross formed, maximum three in a 6x5 board, and you can't skyfall more into place, so you actually will cap out at 1,640 times attack. A little ridiculous, but to be fair, forming three color crosses is not easy. You need to have like two wood, one fire, or two fire, one wood. So it's not feasible to hit that multiplier all the time, however, it's more feasible to hit two, and by hitting two, you actually hit like two crosses will actually deal 182 times attack, which is reasonable. Obviously when you want the big burst, you try and use orb changers and make that 1,600 times, but 182 should sweep most content. Now they have ample time extend, and they do have great synergy of cards like Redandi, who will probably make you enough either wood or fire to trigger your full multiplier. Mm -hmm. But the problem with Akala is that they're 
active skill is just not helpful enough. Like Kenshin, by comparison, at least creates orbs and the Skyfall to help you have more orbs in future turns. Akala does not, so you're relying on your subs more than you ever would normally. Like, yes, if you use cards like Osiris, who generate five wood orbs guaranteed, you can cycle him faster, but the fact that you don't generate orbs is going to put a bit more pressure on you. And the one additional combo is mostly there for combo shields. Like, you should have enough damage in most cases, so you're just helping you overcome a combo shield. But then again, a combo shield of six, when you're forming two crosses, is going to be really hard to do. So you have to form a cross, cross, and two, three others, plus the comp, plus the Burt extra from her Akala. So it's just kind of weird. Like, it, does, it, like, it makes sense, but it doesn't make sense in some regards. Like, it's just not what you need, you probably need more orb generation to be honest. Like yes, you are tanky, so that's great, you can stall things out, you can prep boards, so on and so forth, but it's just a little awkward overall. Furthermore, haste has more value in co-op, I'm sorry, haste has more value in solo mode, but the co-op multiplier it wants you to play co-op, so it's I'm kind, of, I'm kind of getting mixed messages from Akala at this point in time. And outside of this leadership potential, which is potent, I don't feel that they're going to be used much because you have much stronger wood time extend options out there, because their active is just lackluster and they don't bring much offensive capabilities. Next is, jeez, oh Vajra, Vajrayaksa. Regardless, this Wisdom King has an interesting active in the sense that they provide two times a light attack for three turns, so that makes cards like Thor and Loki look a little inferior by comparison because you get one extra turn of damage enhance as well as that turn of haste for only three turns more cooldown, 15 instead of 12. So you have a very potent active skill which can be inherited, which you probably would want to do because the base body is inferior to most other cards just at this point in time. However, it's their, act, it's their leader skill that's kind of unique. They provide four times attack with matching four elements and maximum six times with six elements. But they also provide 30 times of their leader attack after every match. And that 30 times attack is dealt after all your damage. So this is actually a way to kill resolve bosses. Because you deal damage with all your cards, they're brought to one health the boss because resolve, and then the leader of the, this Wisdom King will actually deal a fixed amount of damage to the boss afterwards. So instantly killing their resolve. This is great because you avoid any executions, you avoid resurrections, you avoid horrible mechanics overall, and any resolve boss is vulnerable. So what my recommendation would be is you pair this Wisdom King with either a strong multiplayer rainbow leader such as Raw Dragon, Ranove, or DQXQ, because you can achieve much higher multipliers instead of six times. With DQ you get 60 times, for instance, so that's much stronger, but you instantly kill off these resolve bosses, so you don't have to dance around funny mechanics like Hino Kagetsugu, Goemon, so on and so forth. Like This is great. You instantly kill off these bosses. You're not going to use this Wisdom King all the time as a leader, but when you're faced with lots of resolves, you will easily deal with them because you can pair with a friend who has a high multiplier. So has a niche use that is very powerful, no one else can do this at this point in time, so there's a lot of value here. Furthermore, as an Inherit, they're one of the stronger Inherits because you get three turns of damage enhance, and this three turns of damage enhance is great for longer content like such as, say, Arena, where you need to have like modestly high burst damage going throughout the last few floors because that extra burst damage means you may actually save active skill usage, which means you have a higher success rate, so on and so forth. So it has value as an Inherit and as a niche leader. And finally, we come to Vajrabaharigaba. And they're essentially the dark equivalent to the Light Wisdom King, as they provide three turns of dark damage enhanced for the. Um, like, oh, sorry, it's two times dark damage for three turns. I don't know why I wrote three, it should be changed. And they do. Like, it's basically like another stronger Loki inherit, or. I and I, Freyr, so on and so forth, like you get three turns of damage enhanced. So again, you save actives going through longer dungeons, but it's a leader skill that has the resolve killer effect. You can pair of other dark combo leaders such as ok Okunashi, or even just pure combo leaders at that point. You can pair of ace best cat, so on and so forth, and you can kill resolve bosses with ease. Basically the same usage as the Light Wisdom King, except it's a dark enhance if you use them as an inherit. So, in conclusion, like the Wisdom Kings are unique, they are powerful, they bring new utility and new viability to your monster box, so if you do roll them, they don't sell them away, of course. Like, they have value as inherits or leaders. Like, it may not be used all the time, but it's giving you more tools in your arsenal, and you'll be much be better 
you'll be much more well equipped moving forward into future content. So let me know which Wisdom King or Queen you find most appealing, who do you hope most to roll, where would you plan to use them in the comments below. This article will be linked in the YouTube description, so take a look there if you want to read actually what I wrote. So have a fantastic day and happy puzzling!